Let's pray. Oh Lord, our hearts have been caused to soar, to fly forward in time into eternity, to think about what it will be like to be in your presence, what it will be like to think back on all that you did to bring us into that glorious presence, how you forgave our sins and gave us new hearts. And as we gaze on you, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King, uh, we will be amazed, and surely the amazement will never go away that you would save the likes of us and bring us into such infinite, infinite delight. In the meantime, Lord, we reside here on this earth, in this world, a broken world, a cursed world, a world that isn't as it should be, with a creation that is frustrated, with our own hearts that are often wayward. We long to be pleasing to you, our King, and we pray that you would use your word in our hearts this morning to give us a right perspective on how to live here. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing this morning our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll find ourselves this morning in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I would love for you to turn there. You may be following politics closely during this election cycle. Perhaps you've wondered who to vote for. Well, this morning, I'm going to tell you whom you will vote for. Are you ready? A sinner. If you vote in this election, unless you write in King Jesus, you will be voting for a sinner who will exercise authority imperfectly. What we come to in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 is a remarkable section of Scripture about how to live under flawed authority. And what's needed for this kind of living is wisdom. Wisdom from a very wise man, Solomon, and ultimately wisdom from God. Solomon here will impart for us wisdom for life under authority. That is the point of the first nine verses of this chapter. And we have to remember the setting. Solomon is speaking from the realm of an ancient Near Eastern monarchy. He is a king. And he's a king with absolute authority. What he says goes. What he says should happen, happens. People obey his authority. And when people don't obey the authority of the king, it's trouble. And Solomon may have in mind his own kingdom over which he rules. He has also been exposed to the Persian despots and to other kingdoms with which he would have been familiar. And he understands the ways of kings. There is no Magna Carta here. There's no representative republic. There are no democracies in Solomon's day. Some scholars believe that there's no way that Solomon could have written Ecclesiastes because of these sections that talk about uh, what it means to live under a king. Solomon can't be the author of Ecclesiastes. But in fact, aside from the fact that chapter 1 tells us that Solomon wrote it, um, I think we need to recognize that Solomon's ability to think outside of his own experience was rather remarkable. He had a wisdom that no other human save Jesus Christ himself has had. And he was able to think beyond his own perspective and not just think as a king thinks, but think as someone under a king's authority ought to think. You remember that great scene early in, early in Solomon's life where two harlots came and they were arguing about a baby. Both had been mothers. One harlot's baby died in the night. Both of them claimed the surviving baby. Who was right? They argued back and forth in in court in Solomon's presence. Uh, Do you remember Solomon's solution? He says, hand me a sword. And he brings out the sword and he's threatening to divide the surviving baby in half and give the two parts to the two women. Seems fair. The one woman says, that's a great solution. (laughs) And the mother says, no. No. Let the other have the baby. Let the baby live. What was Solomon doing there? He was appealing to maternal love. Where did he get that? He he wasn't a mother. (laughs) 
Who taught young Solomon to think like a mom? To enter into a mom's world and, and to feel what she would feel in that moment? Solomon had an ability in his wisdom to think outside of himself. That's a wisdom few of us have. Consider Ecclesiastes 9.9. We'll get to that in a few weeks where Solomon gives this wonderful advice to us blue-collar types. <laughs> go to work, go home, love your wife. That's fantastic advice from a man who had a thousand wives and never had a nine-to-five. Right? He was able to get outside of his experience and impart wisdom. So here we have a king speaking to those under the authority of a king and giving them wisdom and advice on how to live. And, and, and this is really helpful. It's a behind-the-scenes perspective on authority. It comes from the one who has absolute authority, and he's giving them advice on how to survive under that authority. It would be kind of like the IRS sending you a detailed, personalized report on how to pay as little in taxes as you possibly can. Now, you and I do not live under the reign of an absolute monarch in the ancient Near East. However, we all live and work under the various authority structures that we're under. And do you know that every single one of them is flawed? Every one of them is flawed. We're going to look this morning at the wisdom that Solomon imparts for life under authority. The first bit of wisdom comes from verses 1 to 6. It is this. Wisdom helps sinners thrive under flawed authority structures. Wisdom helps sinners thrive under flawed authority structures. And I want to define my own words here for a moment. Wisdom is knowledge appropriately applied for skillful living. And I say that wisdom helps. That is, wisdom is not a guarantee. Wisdom is not going to guarantee you that everything will go swimmingly under flawed authority. But it is a help. In other words, wisdom is going to multiply your opportunities to succeed in life under flawed authority. And wisdom avoids the foolishness that increases your odds for calamity. And when I say that wisdom helps sinners, I mean, that's us. <laughs> We're sinners. We're rebellious by nature against God, and we are the reason for the curse and, and the fall. We don't deserve flawless human governance. There's not an inalienable right to some sort of perfect human government. We deserve the just punishment for our sins. And when I say that wisdom helps sinners thrive under flawed authority structures, I mean that every authority structure you could possibly put yourself under in this life is flawed, fatally flawed, because it is populated by people like you <laughs> and people like me, sinners. Let's look together at Solomon's words and Let's read verses 1 to 6 together of Ecclesiastes 8. Who is like the wise man? And who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. I say, keep the commandment of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and a procedure for every delight, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. What we see here in this instruction from Solomon is the benefits of wisdom to help sinners thrive under flawed authority structures. Now let's look at it together. In, in verse 1, we see that wisdom produces a visible or manifest radiance in a life. Look at what Solomon says in verse 1. Who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? Uh, there's nothing comparable to wisdom in a man. And look at the result. A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. Literally, Solomon says here, the strength of his face changes. The idea here is that a, a stern look, a, a troubled countenance softens with the softening of a heart by wisdom. It, it means that a man becomes more gracious and more kind and more ready to extend forgiveness to others. 
And you know what it's like when your face gets stern and rigid and hard because of what's going on inside the heart. Wisdom is there to soften those things and to bring out a radiance and a countenance uh, that actually produces tangible benefits in life. Those benefits that Solomon pulls out for us are specifically in relationship to authority. And then he gives us a number of things to think about in relation to authority. How should we respond? In verse 2, it's about obedience. In verse 3, it's about respect, about not being an insurrectionist. In verse 4, it's about submission. And in verses 5 and 6, it's about procedures and protocol and etiquette before those in authority. Solomon says first in verse 2, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath of God. In other words, obey. God's wisdom here for us under flawed authority is to obey that flawed authority. And this isn't just a horizontal relationship. You see here that Solomon goes vertical. (laughs) Obey because of the oath of God. And some have taken the oath of God as the oath that the king makes to God to govern his people well, or the oath that God makes to David and Solomon specifically that there would be another king that comes someday. Uh, But I think the third option is the best option here. Because of our duty as citizens under God's reign, we submit to the authorities that he sovereignly puts in place over us. It is our sacred oath before God. It is our godly oath that we obey earthly authorities. We know this from New Testament principles, right? When you go to work, who is your boss? Not General Dynamics, not Circle K, but Jesus. And you go to work and you serve your employer well because your real employer, your ultimate authority, is King Jesus who rewards your work. Solomon goes vertical with this command to obey the king. And secondly, the relationship to authority comes with respect. Look at verse 3. Solomon says, do not be in a hurry to leave him. That is, it was a, a sign of disrespect to turn your back on a king, to walk out of his presence before you were dismissed. Now, I remember this in in my own home uh, when I was being um, addressed, cared for sternly by my father. If I turned my back and walked away before he was done with me, that was trouble. And in the presence of an ancient Near Eastern king, it meant death. You didn't do that. It was a sign of disrespect. He's the king. You don't walk out early. You don't turn your back. Listen to Proverbs 20, verse 2. The terror of a king is like the growling of a lion, and he who provokes him to anger forfeits his own life. Right? You recognize that a king is a king, and he has the power to do what he pleases. So don't be foolish. (laughs) Wisdom says respect the king. And you know you respect the authority of the office that's in place, even if the office holder isn't as respectable as he could or should be. The second half of verse 3 gives us another aspect to our relationship to authority. We are not to be rebellious or an insurrectionist. Notice what Solomon says. Do not join in an evil matter. Do not join in an evil matter. That is the one who is joined in some sort of conspiracy, some sort of undermining of that authority. Uh, And this is a a pragmatic instruction. He he gives the reason for that because the king will do whatever he pleases. (laughs) What will the king do to people he thinks are undermining his reign? Off with their heads, right? So just a matter of practical wisdom and instruction. Don't do that. Don't be part of uh, of a group of people who are set on undoing the authority that is there. Next, Solomon enjoins us to submission. Verse 4. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? Right? In the world of the ancient Near Eastern monarchs, you didn't ask questions unless it was, how high would you like me to jump, your highness? (laughs) Right? You didn't undermine the king's authority by questioning his decisions and his authority. There's a place for counsel, and kings would be wise to take counsel. 
and yet citizens would be foolish to offer it unasked. The king doesn't have to answer questions about what he is doing because he is a king. He's a sovereign. He's not accountable to anybody. I'm not suggesting that's the best form of human governance. (laughs) That's just the reality of kings in the ancient Near East. Verses 5 and 6, Solomon helps us to keep in mind the proper protocol. Look at verse 5. He says, He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Now, don't take verse 5 as a promise, some sort of guarantee that if you always follow the rules, everything's going to go great, right? There are exceptions to that. There are people that tried as hard as they could to be loyal to a monarch and still suffered under his inconsistent wrath. But the exceptions demonstrate the principle. Consider the opposite of this. How is life going to go for you if you operate with an unchecked anti-authoritarian chip on your shoulder? Just try it for a while. Every authority that's in place, you just buck the system. You just tell that authority, you can't tell me what to do, and see how life goes. I promise you, it will not go well for you. The principle is you keep the royal command and you experience no trouble. Notice the explanation here, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Solomon goes on in verse 6 to say there is a proper time and procedure for every matter or every delight or every thing. In other words, there is a way to go about things. Even when you think a change needs to be in place, look at the end of verse 6. Though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. You see, the wise may feel a heavy burden, and yet he recognizes that disrespect for the protocol and the proper procedures dishonors the king, and it might bring a good cause to nothing. If you think that there is an unjust law, there's a wise way to go about protesting that law. It it might cost you. But there are also unwise ways to protest injustices. There are unwise ways to go about bringing a correction to a king. And all of this requires wisdom and patience and trust in our true sovereign. And perhaps you can think of some examples in biblical history like Esther who conformed to the protocol and the procedures in order to accomplish a rescue for her people. And God was behind the scenes doing something remarkable to save his people from a, from a tyrant, from a monarch, and from an enemy. And Esther followed the procedures and it, at the right time and the right place she stuck out her neck, put her life on the line to make a stand. There was wisdom in the way that she went about doing that. You may think of Daniel, the prophet, who lived through four rotten administrations. You remember Daniel's life. He followed the protocol. He honored the king. When he dissented, he dissented respectfully. And he and his friends took the consequences for their dissent. You remember the apostles, they said things like, we must obey God rather than men, and they took their lumps. Most governments in human history, you could claim inalienable rights all that you wanted, and the king could just say, (laughs) off with his head. You and I live in a really interesting little sliver of human history. We live in an interesting place even in our present world, a a unique form of governance like no other. And under the worst forms of government, the wise trusted the one true king, entrusting their lives to him, even by submitting to faulty, flawed, even rebellious and sinful governance. What did Jesus say? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Wisdom is so essential for these things. Listen to Proverbs 14, 35. 
The king's favor is toward a servant who acts wisely, but his anger is toward him who acts shamefully. And Proverbs 16, 14, the fury of a king is like messengers of death, but a wise man will appease it. You see, wisdom has a very pragmatic benefit for life under flawed authorities. When you recognize that someone has authority over you, you can say, I don't like authority, therefore I'm going to push against it everywhere I find it. (laughs) And you can see how life would go for you. Or you can trust God with the authority structures he's placed over you. Make appeals where appeals are possible. Make changes where changes are possible. But in the end, you trust God and you submit to the king. Now, you and I do not live under an ancient Near Eastern monarchy. But we are all under authority of various various kinds. A football coach. An employer. A state government. Law enforcement. Federal regulations. An IRS tax code. Homeowners association rules, teachers, parents, pastors in a local church. And Solomon's principles have implications for those relationships. The only difference for us, and this is a significant one, is that we may have the option of exchanging one flawed authority for another. If you don't like the governance of the pastors in your local church, you can go to another church. If you don't like your boss, you can get a new job. If you don't like the local law enforcement, you can move to another county or a different state. You can even leave the country if you don't like the federal regulations. If you don't like your HOA, move to another neighborhood. If you don't like your football coach, play badminton. (laughs) But we will always be under authority. And it will always be flawed. Obedience, respect, not staging a rebellion, submitting properly, following the protocols and procedures, all of that requires humility, wisdom, and trust in your true king. Consider the wisdom here. If the IRS tells you that you must pay some tax that you weren't expecting, what are you to do? Legally contest it. Go through all the proper channels, make proper appeals, but in the end, after all of your options are exhausted, if they say you have to pay it, you pay it. Why? Because it's right? Maybe, maybe not. But because they have the power to enforce it. (laughs) It's as simple as that. If If you don't pay, they can garnish your wages or send you to prison. That's the nature of authority. The nature of authority is not, is it right or is it wrong? But that it has power. It has power. And that leads us to another set or another piece of wisdom. Another piece of wisdom. It is this. Wisdom does not help sinners escape from flawed authority structures. Wisdom does not help sinners escape flawed authority structures. There's a limitation to wisdom. Let's read together verses 7 to 9. If no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death. And there is no discharge in the time of war. And evil will not deliver those who practice it. All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. We might hope that something could come along and fix our broken forms of human government to bring an end to tyranny and corruption and waste, to promote common sense solutions, uphold justice, equity, peace, and prosperity for everyone. Sounds like I'm running for office. We could hope all of those things. And for all of wisdom's benefits for living under flawed authority, wisdom is not enough to get us out from under flawed authority. 
Solomon's point that he's driving at here is found in verse 9. A man exercises authority over another man to his hurt. To his hurt. And he builds that argument from verse 7. The argument goes like this. No one, not even the wise man, can predict the future. Look at verse 7. If no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? Wisdom is not the same thing as omniscience. Wisdom can't predict the future. It has limitations. The future is beyond our grasp. The accurate prediction of future events belongs solely to God. He's the one who has already written those events. Secondly, verse 8, no one, not even the wise man, can restrain the wind. And how often have I wanted to do that? (laughs) You know, you go out to fly a kite, and you're like, why won't the wind blow? And you go water skiing, and why won't the wind stop? (laughs) Nobody can control the wind. Nobody has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, Solomon says. Can you corral the wind and make it do what you want? Nobody can do that. Can you harness the wind to fight the wind? Not a chance. I don't know if you tried this, but as a kid, I always thought that if I just had an electric generator and a great big fan on my sailboat, I could fill the sails with air and move the boat forward. You know, a self-propelled Sailboat, it doesn't work. You can figure out later why, but you can't harness the wind. And you can't harness the wind to fight the wind. Thirdly, in verse 8, Solomon says, no one, not even the wise man, can stop death. Nobody can stop death. No man has authority to restrain the wind, and no one has authority over the day of death. How we would love to stay that hand. That day is in God's hands alone. Nobody can tell death to come back another day. And those who take their own lives wake up in eternity only to discover that their days were numbered by God and they are accountable for their attempt at usurping his prerogative. Next, Solomon says, no one, not even the wise man, can go AWOL. You can't, in the middle of a war, desert the army. He says there is no discharge in a time of war. And this has been the rule of armies for all time. You can't have soldiers who decide they don't want to be in the army after the bullets start flying. And currently in America, we have a volunteer-only military. You don't have to sign up. But you can't desert. (laughs) You can't go AWOL. You can't get away in the middle of battle. And then lastly, in verse 8, Solomon says, No one, not even the wise man, can fight fire with fire. Look at what he says there. Evil will not deliver those who practice it. Listen, you, you think it's been difficult living in a corrupt, evil society under unjust governance. Well, I've been playing by the rules all this time and nothing's changing. Maybe if I quit playing by the rules, what does Solomon say? Evil will not deliver you. It doesn't work that way. Two wrongs don't make the right. You can't fight corruption with corruption. Evil will not deliver those who practice it. You can't take hold of evil like a horse with reins and bit and bridle and saddle and stirrups and spurs and and use evil to get where you want to go. It's been said by others, I'll repeat it here. Sin will always take you farther than you intended to go, keep you longer than you intended to stay, and cost you more than you intended to pay. You can't think that you can employ evil to some good end to accomplish your purposes. It cannot be harnessed safely. So here's Solomon's argument. Just as no one, not even one endowed with wisdom, has authority over wind or death or commanding officers in wartime or the authority to harness evil safely, So no one in this life has authority to extract himself from flawed authority structures. I've seen this evil under the sun, that a man exercises authority over another man to his hurt. You can't get away from it. 
And not all the wisdom in the world can change the fact that authority in this life is wielded by sinful people, and it often leads to the hurt of others. The greater the power given to any individual, the greater the opportunity for that position of authority to be employed to the hurt of others. But you know, it's also true that when power is distributed, trouble comes about. You know, a true democracy where majority vote wins, that's not a good system. Mob rule over individual rights. You see that one person says something that everybody decides isn't great, and the majority wins. Again, authority wielded over others to their hurt. And it's also true when the authority structure is an impersonal bureaucracy. You know, some clerk in a cubicle in some office in a big city, far away, files a few forms, following the directives handed to him from 14 levels up in the management chain of some bloated government agency. And that little action he takes with his little pen and his paper fundamentally alters the lives of real people somewhere far away, and nobody can do anything about it. That is the reality of the world in which we live. And pick your style of government. The truth will be the same. We live under flawed authority, and we are responsible uh, to honor God under that flawed authority. Of course, our hope is not in this world. Our citizenship isn't here. And our king is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Consider Solomon's words in verses 7 to 9. Who is it that can tell the future? Jesus did. He said that you would see the Son of Man coming back just as he has left. Who is it who could restrain the wind? Jesus did. He told the wind, hush, and it stopped on the spot. Who displayed authority over death? Well, of course, Jesus did. In his own death, he said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I will take it up again. And Jesus displays his own authority over death by walking out of his own tomb and then offering resurrection life to all who belong to him. Who is the commanding officer who will fight the battles for his people? Thank you. You can read Revelation 19. Where even his conscripts... (laughs) end up not doing a lot of fighting. But the sword out of Jesus' mouth lays waste to his enemies in the final vindication of God's glory. Who is the one who never committed any evil and yet delivers us from evil? And who is the one with all authority? He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And how does Jesus exercise his authority? Well, over his enemies, there is a day coming when even his enemies will fake obedience to him. And in the end, they will all be destroyed. Every enemy of Jesus will bow the knee. Every enemy of Jesus will confess with the tongue that he is indeed Lord. Jesus, the true king, will be vindicated. And his enemies will give him praise. And to his friends... How has Jesus exercised his authority with those who believe, with those who have entrusted their lives to his care? He says things like this, take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Come to me and you will find rest. He is a king who said he was the servant who had come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he wore a crown, and he wore a robe, the mockery of the humans around him who tortured him before his execution. And a placard was hung over him as he expired. The king of the Jews. He's the king of everyone. And yet he came humble, a servant, 
to die in the place of any who would surrender their lives to him. All of us are under authority from the time we're born to the time that we die. And almost all of that authority is flawed, bad, imperfect, inconsistent. But if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you surrender your life to an authority that promises your best, your infinite good in everything. And that comes from an authority who has the power to keep his promises and a character to fulfill what he said he would do. The wisdom that Solomon gives here is helpful for us, but it's helpful only to the, de- only to the degree that you have put to death your own anti-authoritarian bent. Right? We, we don't naturally like being told what to do. I want to fast forward for us to the New Testament, to Paul's words in Romans 13, where he echoes these same principles. And I just want to read for us verses 1 to 7 of Romans 13. You can turn there if you like. Paul writes, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Let's pray. God, these are your words. And these words are hard for me. I would love to rewrite the script of human history. I would love to put people in authority over me who will do my bidding. I would love for things to change. God, you are the sovereign one over all things. And what needs to change is me, to trust you, to love you, even by showing honor and respect to the authority structures over my own life. God, you are good and you do good all the time and you are in charge of every king and every ruler. You put them exactly where you want them. And God, we need great faith to trust these things, to entrust ourselves to your care. May we never submit to an earthly king in a way that means compromise against you. But may we never rebel against earthly authority for our own selfish interest either. For all these things, we need your infinite wisdom. And we long for the day when your kingdom will come, when you, O Lord, our King, will reign on the earth and your reign will extend into eternity. We long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus.